right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, this is Bonnie McFarlane with LCAP State and Federal Programs, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our second in our series of virtual summer professional development modules. We started on Monday with an overview of uh, federal and state programs and focused particularly on some of the key federal programs that most districts participate in. Today, we're gonna be looking at district level planning. And then next Tuesday will be our next module and we're gonna move into site planning. We have with us today our team and in order of how you'll hear them is Amy Tomamatsu, Evan Bartelheim, Jeannie Keith, Adrian Balcazar, and Rachel Garcia. And just for those of you who didn't join us on Monday, we, um, instead of our normal two-day full directors, we usually had a, a training for new directors. This year, we decided to break it into modules and allow people who were new or experienced to join us for particular topics they're interested in. So we'll be, throughout the month of August, we'll be providing these modules uh, twice a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays at three o'clock. And next slide, we'll go over the outcomes for today. And today we're going to look at district level planning, which starts with the um, LCFF and the funding model and the associated plan, the LCAP. We're also going to look at district advisory committee requirements. And in addition, the LCAP federal addendum, which is also a district level program requirement. And finally, the consolidated application, which is the funding piece, which connects some of those federal programs. Okay. And as always, we're here to support you. And we will be sending out a list of some dates for our regular state and federal programs. We held them off in lieu of the modules over the summer, but we will be resuming them in September. And a list of dates will be going out um, early next week. We have assigned dates for virtual meetings, so we'll continue to meet online at least through December. And then at the end of December, we'll sort of regroup and see what things look like if we're allowed to meet in person or if this continues to be the venue we'll be using. So you should look for that in your email coming early next week. When we do move back to in-person trainings, for those of you who haven't joined us in the past, we always provide two, one at our Downey office, the Lake O'Main building, and one out in the Santa Clarita or Antelope Valley area. And we'll continue to do that um, when we begin meeting in person again. Topics, we also have individual um, topics that we provide uh, workshops on, and that will continue. Again, we uh, did them virtually this year, and that will continue as long as need be. We just finished consolidated application training in June, and we have sur uh, trainings on things like equitable services, FPM. We always are having as LCAP and requirements associated with that uh, evolve. We have training on that, and then some fiscal areas parent involvement, and school site council training. So we'll continue to have those kind of workshops to meet your needs, again, you know, virtually for now. And then, as always, please contact us. You can get uh, any of us through the SFP mailbox. You'll get a quick response. Whoever's available will respond to you. Or please contact any of our coordinators. They're all here to help you. And some of you, I know, work directly with them and are comfortable getting in touch with them. Please continue to do that. All right, so today we'll, um, we will uh, respond to those questions that we can answer. So put your questions, please, in the chat box. And then um, we will, at the end of each week, we're going to collect questions from the two modules for that week and send that uh, out to all the participants. And then each week we will add to those questions. So you'll have a growing list that's a Q&A for all the modules by the end of the series. So now I'm going to turn it over to Amy Tomamatsu, and she's going to start by taking a look at state programs and looking at LCFF, in particular, the funding formula. Amy? Yes, thank you. Next slide, please. So the current model um, in California school funding is called the Local Control Funding Formula, or LCFF to sh for short. So to start, I'm gonna share a brief history of the early discussions that reflected a shift in thinking about funding allocation methodologies to schools in California, which culminated in the eventual development of what we know today as LCFF. 
the the change to the current um, the change to the to the current weighted funding formula followed a sequence of discussions and shifts in categorical funding over the course of several years. And that's what you see here on this slide. The roots of the current formula, um, beginning with State Senator Alpert in 2000, um, where he engaged in the work with the Public Policy Institute of California to expand the master plan for higher education to include elementary and secondary schools. Conversations and research began about a revised funding model based on the added costs of educating certain groups of students. So at this point in time, this did not result in any changes to funding formulas or legislation, but that was kind of um, some, one of the roots to, to what we know today, today as LCFF. In 2007, Michael Kirst, Alan Burson, and Goodwin Liu published a paper on school finance, which became the catalyst for the new funding formula. The paper focused on four key elements, uh, which included number one, base funding for all students, number two, additional funding for special education, uh, number three, targeted additional funding for low-income students and targeted additional funding for English learners, and number four, regional cost adjustments. So some of these concepts were part of Governor Brown's 2012 LCFF proposal for a weighted student formula, which proposed additional funding for ELs and low-income students. Um, that proposal in 2012 didn't pass, but conversations did continue. So then in July 2013, the next proposal, which was known as AB 97, resulted in chapter legislation and a new ed code for what we know now as LCFF. So LCFF defined a new funding formula for California. For California. What's important to note with the history behind LCFF is the tension between the flexibility that uh, local schools and districts have um, and also how to ensure that LEAs are supporting high need students. It took quite some time to find that balance. And so now in exchange for local control and greater flexibility, how can we ensure that the needs of students such as English learners, foster youth and low income students are receiving the programs and services they need um, with the additional funding that's being generated to support these students. That this tension is exactly why it took so long to get to the eventual LCFF formula. The point is that if we don't do it well, uh, if we don't ensure uh, equity and increased or improved services, what may happen next? Uh, the other side of the argument would win, that, we, that flexibility is too much. But um, what, we, what we are now seeing with this really is that the, the, the tension surfaces in the form of complaints. So just a key point there is that with that greater flexibility, we still have that responsibility to support uh, high need students. The next slide, it shows us a comparison of what the old funding formula looked like in comparison to the, to the current LCFF. So in the old formula, we had the numerous state categoricals, each with their own purpose and their own rules. Many of those were eliminated. And so what we have now with LCFF, uh, simply speaking, is that we have base funds provided for all students based on total pupil enrollment. And the formula then allocates additional funds based on the number and the concentration of unduplicated pupils uh, which is defined as English learners, foster youth, and low-income pupils. So a little more on unduplicated pupils in the next slide. So in addition to that LCFF base, um, the funding formula provides two levels of additional funding based on the number and concentration of unduplicated pupils. This term is used to describe the count of students who are uh, low-income, English learner, or foster, and or foster youth. For example, if a student is simultaneously low income and English learner and foster youth, they're still only counted once, thus the term unduplicated pupils count. Um, so LEAs receive an increase in funding called the supplemental grant, which is a per pupil allocation based on the unduplicated count of those English learners, foster youth, and low income students. Additionally, LEAs with high concentrations of 55% or more unduplicated pupils will receive additional funding. These are just the basics of the LCFF formula. And on the next slide, we have a little graphic to illustrate this further. This visual summarizes how LCFF funds LEAs. So first the base funding, which we talked about, 
funded on a per pupil allocation, also based on grade span. Um, additional funds are added to this for pupils in grades K-3 for class size reduction and also an additional grade span adjustment for 9-12. In the next layer down, um, we see the supplemental increase based on the unduplicated count of English learners, foster youth, and low-income students. And the final row at the bottom for LEAs with high concentrations, um, those LEAs will receive an additional allocation. The LEA has an obligation to identify and describe actions and services contributing to increased or improved services using the additional funds provided as supplemental and or concentration grant funding calculations. And those um, will be further discussed uh, when we get into the LCAP, which is the plan, which is typically, not this year, but typically used to describe um, the action services that districts implement um, with the LCFF funding. And then the next slide, just a quick slide. This We talked about the grade span adjustments briefly, the requirement, there are some requirements tied to that CSR, and this slide shares those requirements and uh, adherence to these requirements are addressed through the annual audit process. So that's just a qu quick overview of LCFF and next we'll turn it over to, I believe, Evan, who will cover the next portion with the LCAP. Thanks, Amy. Uh, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, I am going to kick off a little discussion of the LCAP, which as Amy already noted, um, has been suspended for the 2020-21 school year, but it still remains the primary district level planning tool. And I think as we go through this, you'll see that many of the elements of the LCAP are still um, really critical to understand with regards to the learning continuity plan that uh, has replaced it for this year. Next slide, please. So in, con uh, in conjunction with the adoption of the local control funding formula, LEAs, uh, including both charter schools and county offices, were required to adopt a three-year LCAP that would be updated annually by July 1st of each year. And in this plan, um, they are required to provide the annual goals that are uh, designed to help all students, uh, all pupils and subgroups achieve uh, and meet the each state priority area and any local priorities. priorities. Um, specific actions the LEA will take each year for all students and a description of the expenditures to serve the unduplicated pupils, the English learners, low income and foster youth. Um, it also requires an annual update, um, which includes an assessment of the effectiveness of each action. And uh, this is uh, one element of the uh, LCAP that's been revised. We're gonna talk a little bit about that revision process as we go along. Next slide. So a key part of uh, the LCAP is kind of understanding how to frame it because it can be seen, could be seen as strictly a compliance document, but in fact, the, the intent is much broader than that. So in, in developing and finalizing the LCAP for adoption, LEAs are encouraged to keep the, the following overarching frame at the forefront of the strategic planning and stakeholder engagement functions. Um, given the present performance across state priorities and on indicators in the California School Dashboard, which um, parenthetically is also suspended for this year. Um, how is the LEA using its budgetary resources to respond to student and community needs and address any performance gaps, including by meeting its obligation to increase or improve services for the foster youth, English learners, and low-income students? So it really is an intentional uh, process where the uh, LEA should be helping its stakeholders understand its priorities. Next slide, please. So just a quick overview for what district, there's a slight difference between what districts and charter schools are required. So the district um, LCAP requirements, first they must use a state board adopted template or a variation thereof. So we have our own ELCAP uh, system. The state um, also has an online tool. And in fact, the new uh, template when we eventually utilize it is really designed to be used exclusively online. They must develop a plan in consultation with teachers, principals, administrators, other school personnel, parents, parent advisory groups, including the English Learner Parent Advisory Committee, as well as pupils, they must present the LCAP to a parent advisory committee and respond in writing to comments to both committees, I sh should say, um, that are required. They must hold a public hearing and they must submit um, the plan for approval to the county office um, with technical assistance provided, if not approved. And then they must update annually, providing that annual update on, on progress. Next slide, please. 
uh, charter schools that I noted are somewhat different. Um, they are required for both the locally funded and direct funded charter schools. Um, however, there is no bargaining unit or parent uh, consultation or parent advisory committee required uh, by law. They must address the priority areas that are laid out within their charter um, that apply specifically to the grade level served and the nature of their program. Um, they didn't used to require public hearing, but one that was a change in ed code for this year. Um, so a public hearing is now required for charter schools. Um, the governing board of the charter adopts the LCAP and it is submitted to both the authorizer and the county office of education. And uh, another um, uh, victim this year, the 64001J ed code allows uh, the LCAP to serve as the uh, school-wide plan for student achievement as long as that the LCAP meets both federal school planning requirements and, as well as the stakeholder requirements. But without an LCAP, uh, charters are this year forced to also generate a, a SIPs. Next slide, please. Um, so there was, like as I mentioned, there is a redesign to the template this year, um, and it was required by law. Um, uh, AB 1840, which passed in 2018, amended Ed Code um, to make revisions to the LCAP and the annual update with the intent to accomplish um, a streamlining of the content and format of the LCAP to make the information more accessible for parents and stakeholders. In addition, uh, the, it presented, the presented information about the actions that contributed to increased or improved services for unduplicated pupils um, needed to be shown more clearly um, whether the increased or improved services are targeted to specific school sites or provided on a district-wide or county-wide or charter basis. Um, so there are some new features and modifications that you'll see in the next series of slides that resulted from this change in the, in the law. Next slide, please. So these are just a, an overview of the, the various parts of the um, template that we're gonna be going over. We'll start with the budget overview for parents. We're gonna go slightly out of order. Uh, the expenditure tables are more closely linked to the budget overview and I'll show you, explain that in just a minute. This was the template, what you'll be seeing, which is adopted back in January 8th of this year. Um, it's really not the 2020-23 template any longer because we won't be implementing it until 2021, um, assuming that it made things go forward as, as uh, as planned. Next slide, please. Uh, so the budget overview for parents was actually a relatively new uh, development. It started in 2019. Um, and the budget overview uh, was designed to develop a summary document for parents uh, in conjunction with um, the LCAP. And, and it was designed to be attached as a cover to the LCAP in the annual update. Um, the LCFF budget overview for parents uh, comprise a single document when combined with the LCAP and the annual update. The budget overview requires reporting of the projected general fund expenditures for the ensuing year uh, by funding source, including all the funds allocated under the LCFF, as well as other state funds, local funds, and all federal funds, um, and the amount that's included in the LCAP. Um, the amount apportioned on the basis of low income students, English learners, and foster youth. Uh, for the ensuing year must be detailed, and the amount budgeted for increased or improved services for those students. Also required is the amount budgeted in the existing year, the current year that you're submitting, uh, for increased or improved services for unduplicated pupils and the estimated actual expenditures for those services. Now, depending on your responses within, within this budget overview, um, a district may need to write a narrative description of activities or programs supported by any funds that aren't included in the LCAP. This oftentimes looks like your um, maintenance costs or things that aren't, aren't listed in there. You don't have to list every single penny in the LCAP. Um, you also may have to address the extent if there's a difference between the budgeted expenditures in the ensuing year and the amount apportioned on the basis of your unduplicated pupils, how the actions and services will still meet the requirement to improve services for unduplicated students. And finally, if there's a difference between the budgeted expenditures for the existing year that, that are not included in the estimated actual expenditures, um, LEAs must address how this impacted the, the planned actions and services that are included in the LCAP. Next slide, please. Um, so in addition to this, the, the LCAP this year would have been uh, this, this intent to make expenditures more uh, transparent to stakeholders um, through the inclusion of these expenditure tables. So the tables, uh, you kind of see an example here. Um, the tables are all populated by information that are entered into a primarily a data entry table. And these uh, for each action in the LCAP, 
and then the information entered into this table is automatically populating populates the other expenditure tables. Um, there are four tables that appear, um, and you'll see one coming up when uh, Jeannie does her part, but the actions table, which is all actions throughout the plan, the total expenditures table, the contributing expenditures table, which are just those uh, expenditures related to unduplicated pupils for increased or improved services, and then the annual update expenditures, which um, wouldn't, have, wouldn't have appeared this year because of the kind of shift in the, the plan. The data entry table itself is, is not required to appear, but uh, there is an option for LEAs to include that if they so wish. Next slide, please. So the plan summary um, is, is the, you know, the entry point for the, the document. Um, the well-developed plan summary section provides a meaningful context for the LCAP. Uh, this section provides information about an LEA's community as well as relevant information about student needs and performance. In order to provide a meaningful context for the rest of the LCAP, the content of this section um, needs to be clearly and meaningful relate, meaningfully related to the content included in the subsequent sections of the LCAP. And here I've kind of done a short summary so you can see the various parts of uh, that you might be addressed uh, in the the very in the, the boxes. Um, there are some required components in the identified need area. So based on the state dashboard, you may have to identify specific student uh, student groups that are performing below the all student level, as well as uh, any um, areas in which um, you scored uh, on the dashboard in red or orange overall. Next slide. Also included in the plan summary section is are three prompts for the comprehensive support and improvement school. So any LEA or a charter that is identified for comprehensive as eligible for comprehensive support and improvement would need to complete these. And it's pretty straightforward. Um, first prompt just to identify the school. Um, and then within the next two prompts, um, first is LEAs must identify the support for these identified schools. Uh, that includes a school level needs assessment, evidence-based interventions, as well as identification of any resource inequities that might have been identified in the, during the planning. And they must also identify how they plan to monitor and evaluate the implementation and effectiveness of the CSI plan. Next slide, please. Um, the stakeholder engagement section is the next principal section. This section asks for a description of the involvement of stakeholders in the planning process for the LCAP and the annual update and analysis. Um, in addition, LEAs must describe the impact that involvement had on the LCAP for the coming year. The, the stakeholder engagement section should address consultation with required groups and other requirements in the approval process. And these are described in the state programs section uh, of our handbook. Stakeholder engagement must take place annually and must be described each year in the LCAP. Um, new in 2018-19 was the inclusion of a uh, requirement to consult with the with the special education local plan administrators at the SELPA regarding ser services for students with disabilities in the LCAP. Next slide, please. So here's just a brief listing of the required stakeholder group. Um, just noting the LCAP development process was intended to result in um, decisions that were made through meaningful stakeholder engagement. And so um, the thought being that stakeholders, different stakeholders possess valuable perspectives and insights about NLEA's programs and services. So effective strategic planning would incorporate these perspectives and insights to identify potential goals and actions to be included. Uh, there's a slight difference, as I noted earlier, between uh, the required stakeholder groups for a, a district and for a charter school that are noted here. Next slide, please. So with regards to the purpose, the stakeholder engagement, um, this is from, from Ed Code, um, 52064. Um, notably, stakeholder engagement is an ongoing annual process, so it's not just a mad scramble at the last minute to pull all these people together, but it really should be looked at as an ongoing process that includes comprehensive strategic planning. It meets accountability um, for, the, for the LEA and focuses on improvement across the state priorities uh, as well as locally identified priorities. Next slide. Thank you. Um, so additionally, the stakeholder engagement um, section is designed to reflect how engagement influenced the decisions reflected in the LCAP. And uh, it's, this, its goal is to allow stakeholders that participate, participate in the LCAP development process, as well as the broader public, to understand how the LEA engaged stakeholders and the impact that that engagement had. 
LEAs are encouraged to think of this, uh, keep this goal in the forefront when they're completing this section. Next slide, please. So finally, the LCAP uh, should be shared with uh, the, with, and input should be requested from additional groups, including the school level, uh, school site level advisory groups as applicable, such as the school site councils, the English learner advisory councils, student advisory groups, um, to better facilitate the alignment of the district level uh, plans with the school site level plans. And now I'm going to turn over to Jeannie to continue with some LCAP discussion. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to take a look at the goals and actions uh, section. And for the upcoming 2021-22 school year, LEAs will be developing their goals and actions. In this section, there are uh, four components. And LEAs develop goals that clearly communicate what the LEA plans to accomplish, what the LEA plans to do in order to accomplish the goal, and how the LEA will know when it has accomplished the goal. Here, LEAs include a goal statement, associated metrics and expected outcomes, and the actions that should be in alignment to the goal. At a minimum, this section includes goals and actions to address all LCFF state priorities and associated uh, metrics. And in addition, LEAs provide an explanation for why they included each goal and the related metrics, outcomes, actions, and expenditures to support progress uh, toward the goal. Next slide. The goal analysis is now incorporated um, from the annual update section in the prior template. An annual update is required by statute and has been a part of the LCAP since 2015 when LEAs were first required to use it to report on the LCAP. This analysis requires the LEA to reflect on the actions and expenditures included in the current year plan. In the first section, LEAs describe overall implementation of actions in the current year to achieve the goal, including a discussion of challenges and successes they experience with implementation. In the second section, the LEA explains material differences between what they budgeted and their estimated actual expenditures. In the third section, LEAs describe the effectiveness of the specific actions in the goal to achieve the goal as measured by the outcomes in the goal. In some cases, not all actions in a goal will be intended to improve performance on all of the metrics associated with the goal. So when responding to the prompt, LEAs might assess the effectiveness of a single action or a group of actions within that goal in the context, context of performance on a single metric or a group of specific metrics within the goal that are applicable to the specific set of actions. So grouping actions with metrics will allow for more robust analysis of whether the strategy the LEA is using to impact a specific set of metrics is working and will also increase uh, transparency for stakeholders. Finally, in the last section here, LEAs describe any changes made to their goal, expected outcomes, metrics, or actions that they intend for the year coming as the result of their analysis um, in this section. Next slide, please. Foundational to the LCAP goal and actions uh, section are the eight state priorities. Annual goals and actions are required to support all students in achieving goals tied to all of the eight state priorities, as well as additional actions that they include to provide increased or improved services to support the unique needs of their English learners, low income and foster youth in achieving these um, goals. Next slide. When districts and charters are planning goals and actions, it's critical to ensure teams determining what they include address the eight state priorities and the actions address the specific needs and performance levels of their student groups that align to their state and local data, as well as input from stakeholders. 
a goal statement, associated metrics, and expected outcomes and actions in the goal should be in alignment. This alignment positions the LEA and stakeholders to reflect on the implementation of their actions and reflect on their pro progress using explicit outcomes related to the actions in their goal. Next slide. The measuring and reporting uh, results section is where the LEAs are required to identify how they will measure and report results using state required metrics and locally designed metrics. For the first year of a three-year LCAP cycle, LEAs first identify the related metrics they will use to track progress toward the expected outcomes related to the goal. In the second column, LEAs include baseline data, reflecting the most recent data associated with the metric. And in the last column, LEAs indicate a desired outcome that the LEA expects to achieve by the end of the three-year LCAP cycle. In each subsequent LCAP year, the LEA tracks annual progress by entering the most recent data for each of these metrics in the annual outcome column for each related year. Uh, next slide, please. The next slide provides a, um, a resource for you. And this resource um, explains the metric data sources needed to align to the state priorities. And included in this chart are required state collected metrics, locally collected metrics, and uh, data informing local indicators. The chart displayed uh, provides these related metrics for each of the state priorities and includes where and how this data can be accessed, either as a state data piece of data or as a locally collected piece of data. Our unit developed this tool in collaboration with Jessica Conkle, who leads the Assessment Accountability Division at LACO. And this tool is available on our website and it may assist LEAs as they are engaging in their planning to develop goals and related metrics for the LCAP for the upcoming 21-22 school year. Next slide, please. Keep in mind, measuring and reporting results is a key component in the LCAP. Consistency in use of data and data sources supports clear outcomes and reflection with a focus on continuous improvement. Within the LCAP template, data descriptions are included to identify and address needs in the plan and in determining effectiveness in the annual goal analysis, as well as in the descriptions, which we will see addressing effectiveness of school-wide and district-wide actions that the LEA includes in their plan as contributing to the increased or improved services requirement for unduplicated pupils. Next slide, please. Here's the action section of uh, the goal and action section. And for each goal, the LEA is required to include related actions identify which actions contribute to the requirement to increase or improve services for unduplicated pupils. Here, LEAs provide a title, a description of the action, total funds for each action, and indicate if the action is contributing to the increased or improved services requirement as compared to services provided for all students. Actions that contribute to the increased or improved services requirement for unduplicated pupils, improve the quality of services for the intended student group, or increase the quantity of service, services to address the needs of the intended student group. You'll notice that the title of the action included in this section was included in the expenditure tables in which Evan uh, previously shared. Next slide, please. So far in our review of the template, we have seen um, places where the LCAP template addresses the annual update requirements. Specifically in these three sections in the template, we've seen reflection in the measuring and reporting results, in the goal analysis, as well as in the annual update table in the expenditure tables 
reporting the estimated actuals. Next slide, please. The increased or improved services section addresses how the LEA is increasing or improving services as compared to services for all students in proportion to the increased funding apportioned on the basis of the number and concentration of unduplicated pupils. LEAs indicate the percentage by which services for unduplicated pupils must be increased or, or improved as compared to services provided to all students in the LCAP year. And they indicate the amount of the increased apportionment based on the number and concentration of their unduplicated pupil population. This proportionality calculation reflects the increased apportionment for the LCAP year. In this section, LEAs must provide two descriptions that connect to the actions and expenditures they have included in the goals and actions section as contributing to the increased or improved services requirement. The first prompt requires LEAs to provide a description for each LEA-wide or school-wide contributing action that explains how those services are principally directed toward and effective in meeting the goals for unduplicated pupils. An LEA de demonstrates how an action is principally directed toward and effective in meeting the LEA's goals for these students when it explains three things. One, how it considered the needs, conditions, and circumstances of its unduplicated pupils. Two, how the action or aspects of the action is based on these considerations. And three, how the action is intended to help achieve an expected measurable outcome of the associated uh, goal. Additional explanations are required for uh, LEAs with less than 55% uh, school-wide or less than 40% or less than 55% district-wide and less than 40% school-wide for actions occurring either LEA-wide or school-wide. The second prompt requires the LEA to provide an overall description to explain how actions for the unduplicated pupils are increased or improved in proportion to the increase in funding for these students. LEAs describe how services provided for these students are increased or improved by at least the percentage calculated as compared to services provided for all students in the LCAP uh, year. All right, next slide, please. Since the inception of the LCFF, CDE has received multiple complaints regarding LCAPs and the LEA's response to explaining their use of the increased apportionment of the supplemental and concentration grant apportionment in the LCAP. The CDE's response to an appeal uh, filed based on an initial uh, complaint in Fresno Unified School District was significant in two ways. One, it brought forward to the attention of the public and the community, the question regarding the effective and appropriate use of additional funds to provide increased or improved services for English learners, foster youth and low income pupils. And two, it also provided guidance and a definition for what it means and how to describe that an action is principally directed and effective in meeting the needs of these students to achieve the goals in the LCAP. In, included on the slide are the LCFF spending regulations, which are outlined in the Title V California uh, Code of Regulations. Next slide. The CDE response to the appeals referenced these Title V California Code of, of Regulations, which are the LCFF spending regulations for supplemental and concentration uh, grants. Next slide. From the response to the, uh, to the appeal complaints, clarification was provided about what it means for an action to be principally directed to and effective for unduplicated pupils. 
The response is included on the slide. You can see the first component addresses how an LEA needs to design a service to intentionally ad address the specific needs of the unduplicated pupil group. And second, how the action needs to be designed to address those unique needs. And on the next slide, we can see how the third component of the description needs to include how the service being provided will be effective to support the intended student groups to achieve the goals in the, in the LCAP. LEAs must address these three components in their descriptions of school-wide or district-wide services they have identified as contributing to the increased or improved services requirement. Next slide, please. Here we see that there's an additional um, requirement for LEAs with less than 55% uh, unduplicated pupil count or for actions being provided on a school-wide level where the school unduplicated pupil count is less than 40%. And there's an additional explanation for how these, the use of these funds will be the most effective um, to support the unduplicated pupils in these contexts. Next slide, please. And in uh, response to other allegations and responses included in LCATS, the new template includes specific language regarding um, conclusory statements. And CDE has um, provided clarification addressing these conclusory statements, which do not connect how the actions will achieve a specific outcome related to the goal for the unduplicated pupil group. Therefore, conclusory statements are not a sufficient uh, response in this section. And we've provided three conclusory statements that demonstrate how they do not make the connection between the action and the expected outcome. Next slide, please. From the overview of the LCAP sections, you have seen many places where fiscal and program information is integrated. Therefore, it's critical that LEAs determine how their program and fiscal personnel will work together to ensure alignment across actions, reporting budget information, expenditure tables, and the budget overview for, for parents. Next slide. Finally, the approval criteria is included on, um, on the slide for you, and this is the criteria with which county offices uh, used to uh, approve uh, LCAPs. And on the last slide, our website is included and here you can find LCAP resources, including the online template advisories, as well as um, uh, um, dates uh, for our LCAP uh, training. I know that was quick, but it was an overview and um, please let us know if you have any questions. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Adrian to address the learning continuity and attendance plan that is it, it currently being developed. Uh, before we move on, there was um, a question and maybe you can address it specific to this section. Right. And it had to do with, they were asking, is there a guidance for determining or calculating the percentage by which you're required to increase or improve services and a respective dollar amount? Uh, yes, um, through business advisory services, that apportionment is, uh, can be um, accessed and districts work closely with business advisory services to provide their fiscal information. And the LCFF calculator actually does that calculation as well as a internal calculator at business advisory services. And it will show your increased apportionment and uh, do the calculation, which is part of the local control funding formula. 
Thanks, Jeannie. One other question that was related to that. Does that mean we have to identify which expenditures relate to the increased or improved services? Yes. Um, when you're including in your, uh, your LCAP and identifying that yes or no, you're identifying the actions and the expenditures that are contributing to the increased or improved services requirement. Great, thanks so much. Just one other thing that came up, there wasn't a question, but just wanted to, um, uh, Evan talked about the, the comprehensive support and improvement descriptions. Just uh, in case people are wondering, we um, are, are not sure at this time how that's going to be addressed. That's been, uh, the state has a responsibility for approving those plans and the process they've used are the descriptions of the district support in the LCAP. So we anticipate additional information will be coming as to how those CSI plans will be reviewed this year. So just one. Okay, Adrian, move us on to this year now. <laughs> okay, so here we are during the pandemic. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, you know, for this 2021 school year, Senate Bill 98 has recently established the requirement of a learning continuity and attendance plan. LEAs, charters, and County Office of Education are now required to develop and adopt a learning continuity plan. SB 98 eliminated the requirement for LEAs to adopt an LCAP or the annual update for this school year, the 2021 school year. So although the learning continuity plan is not the LCAP, it is important to remember that the local control funding formula, the LCFF, and the associated spending regulations are still in place. And you will see some references to those requirements in this new current plan. The bill also separates the development of the LCAP for the 2021 school year from the budget overview for parents. So as Evan showed, that um, the budget overview for parents is still in place so that while no LCAP is required for this year, the budget overview is, is required to be submitted by December 15th of 2020. Here's a screenshot of the learning continuity and attendance plan for the 2021 school year that was released by CDE last Friday, July 31st. The template has uh, the following main sections, one being the general information, the stakeholder engagement, continuity of learning and instruction, specifically addressing the in-person instructional offerings, distant learning program, and addressing pupil learning loss. Included in this plan is the mental health and social and emotional well-being pupil and family engagement and outreach for those um, you know, students that uh, don't show up, what's your plan to reach out to those families and those students. Also looking at school nutrition, uh, you're able to include additional actions to implement the learning continuity plan. And something that you saw from Jeannie's uh, presentation is the increased or improved services for foster youth, English learners, and low-income students. Here is the timeline table, and the key date in this timeline that you see here is the due date of the plan, which is September 30th of 2020. The timeline includes planning considerations prior to September 30th, as well as steps after this date. You can see, and you, and you will probably <laughs> are living, that it's a very short timeline between now and the due date of the learning continuity plan. And so prior to the release of the template, CDE was recommending and encouraging that LEAs begin the, the planning process. So to assist LEAs and charters in this planning and the development of the plan, our LACO unit developed a planning tool that was based on the requirements that, that were set forth in SB 98 at code 43509. And so we do have reference for that, uh, that can help in the development. Ed code required that the CDE release the template and as mentioned, it was released on Friday and they are also providing Tuesday at two webinar series uh, going they began on July 28th, August 4th and for many of you that attended today prior to, to our, our workshop, uh, we, they have been going over the learning continuity plan and they will continue next week as well. 
Before the required public hearing, the LEA must consult with all the required stakeholder groups. And for school districts, the superintendent must also present the learning continuity plan to the parent advisory committee and the English learner parent advisory committee at separate meetings. And with the additional requirement of the superintendent to respond in writing to any comments that were made at those parent advisory committees. Next on the timeline, LEAs will need to plan for the public hearing at a public board meeting and then on to the second public board meeting, the plan will be adopted. This meeting for board adoption of the plan must occur after the public hearing and not on the same day. The stakeholder engagement, public hearing and adoption requirements are similar to the requirements that we, we just saw in the past uh, with the LCAP and moving forward as well. After your plan is adopted by the governing board or the body of the LEA, they, you will file the plan with the county office not more than five days later. Charters will file their plan with the, both the county office and their chartering authority. For LEAs in LA County, plans will be submitted through the LCAP, uh, the ELCAP online uh, LACO system. And also the LEA is required to post their board adopted plan to the homepage of their LEA website. Next on the timeline here, we see that this is for school districts. The county office will have until October 30th to submit any recommendations in writing to the school district for which they must consider within 15 days at a public meeting. And the last item on this timeline is the budget overview for parents. SB 98 put in Ed Code 43509 the requirement that to submit the, the budget overview for parents by December 15, 2020, at the same board meeting as the first interim budget. And this piece of the former LCAP is still required as the date gets close, closer, we will provide updates for all of you on this aspect of the budget overview for parents. In looking at state programs, we have other state programs that exist. One is the ACES program and the purpose of this after school, after school education and safety program is for school districts and to, to uh, work collaboratively to provide an academic uh, literacy and support for safe constructive alternatives for youth. The ACES program must be aligned and it must not, it must be aligned to your um, your program, but uh, it has to be extended learning opportunities. There also is a requirement for annual evaluation, including research-based indicators and outcomes of student performance, academic performance, attendance, and positive behavior changes. And also the grant is renewed every three years. Another state program that exists is the Low Performing Students Block Grant. This was, uh, the funds were allocated in 18, 19 school year and the, whoever received these funds have until the 2021 school year to extend these funds. It was based on pupils that were identified as low performing on the state assessments of English language arts and mathematics. And that would not necessarily be given supplemental grant uh, money under the LCFF funding uh, formula as well as uh, if they you know weren't part of special education services as well and so LEAs are required to develop a plan describe how those funds are going to be used to increase or improve uh, evidence-based services and to uh, increase student achievement and they must also measure the effectiveness and there are two reports that are required with this low performing students block grant one was due back a year ago, March 1st, 2019, and um, coming up next year is November 1st, 2021. So these are some other state programs. And now moving forward, Rachel will go over the LCAP federal addendum. Uh, before you go, Adrian, yeah. we have one question for you. Okay. Uh, folks are wondering, is there a pre-review process available for the community <laughs> plan? Want to talk to that? Of, of course, <laughs> of course, you know, we're always here to, to, to support. And so, um, you know, reaching out if you're a school district, I suppose, um, 
reach out to your respective um, uh, uh, coordinator and we can assist you. Um, I guess I'll leave it to anyone else in our team that wants to answer any more to that. Yeah, we'll be sending something out just to let people know, but absolutely, please contact your regular LCAP uh, contact, and we're happy to provide input prior to you taking it to the board. Any support we can provide, we're here for you. Okay, Rachel. Great, thank you. Hello, everyone. In this next section, we'll be taking a look at the LCAP federal addendum. Um, next slide, please. So within California, LEAs that apply for ESSA funds are required to complete the LCAP, the LCAP federal addendum, and the consolidated application. So the federal addendum in conjunction with the LCAP and the CONAP serve to meet the federal ESSA LEA plan requirements. Next slide, please. So as mentioned, the federal addendum is required in order to receive federal funds. And this includes Title I, Title II, Title III, and Title IV. And LEAs must ensure that the addendum addresses all required provisions of the ESSA programs and funding for which it is applying. The LCAP federal addendum is only required to be submitted to the CDE for approval once during the current authorization of ESEA. This means that LEAs are not required to annually submit an updated addendum to the CDE. Only LEAs seeking federal funding for the first time are required to submit a board approved 2020-21 federal addendum to the CDE. So for example, if an LEA previously did not apply for Title IV funds, but would like to apply for Title IV funds for the 2021 school year, then the LEA would need to complete and submit the Title IV portion of the addendum to CDE for approval. And the CDE has not yet provided a timeline for this submission process. Next slide, please. Although LEAs are not required to annually submit an updated federal addendum to CDE, LEAs are encouraged to locally review and update their addendum as part of their yearly strategic planning process. So any significant changes to federal programs in the addendum should be documented locally and approved by the local governing board. And here are some considerations in reviewing and updating the addendum. So one example is the Title I Educator Equity section this section may need to be updated from the previous addendum in light of changes by the State Board of Education to the definitions for ineffective, inexperienced, or out of field teacher. For the Title III section, if an LEA is selected for an FPM review for the English Learner Program, reviewers will request the Title III section of the addendum as evidence for EL item four. So if there have been any changes to your program for English learners, you'll want to be sure that those changes are reflected in the addendum. Another example is transferability. So if the LEA previously noted that funds would be transferred to a different program, so for example, let's say the previous year, the LEA transferred Title IV funds to Title I, and you are no longer transferring funds, then the applicable section should be updated in the addendum to align with your current programs. The LCAP federal addendum is also monitored through the FPM process in the Supporting Effective Instruction Program for item three. And for this item, CDE reviewers will request your LCAP federal addendum and not just the Title II section. For this, they'll request the whole addendum and will look specifically for evidence that the LEA has reviewed and revised the addendum. So basically your federal addendum should address what you are currently doing in your district with federal programs and funds. Next slide, please. Here is a screenshot of the LCAP federal addendum template, as well as a screenshot of the federal addendum submission system so for LEAs that are seeking federal funds for the first time, 
The addendum will need to be submitted to CDE through this submis submission system, which can be accessed on the CDE website. Next slide, please. So for this next section, we'll be taking a look at the various district level advisory committees and their requirements. Next slide, please. There are two distinct parent advisory committees required to provide input in the development of the LCAP per Education Code 52063. And both of these advisory committees must also provide input in the development of the learning continuity plan as Adrian mentioned. So the first is the parent advisory committee, which must be composed of a majority of parents of pupils and must include parents or guardians of English learners, foster youth, and low income students. The second required committee is the English learner parent advisory committee. And this committee is required if the school district enrollment includes at least 15% English learners and at least 50 students who are English learners. The English Learner Parent Advisory Committee must be composed of a majority of parents of English learners. And a, a school district is not required to establish a new English Learner Parent Advisory Committee if the district has an existing committee that meets these requirements, such as the DLAC. Next slide, please. A district English Learner Advisory Committee, or DLAC, is required when a school district has more than 50 English learners. The DLAC must be composed of a majority of parents of English learners, and each school's ELAC must have the opportunity to elect at least one of its members to serve on the DLAC. If a district has 31 or more ELACs, a system of proportional representation may be used. Another important requirement is that it is the school district's responsibility to provide appropriate training to the DLAC to assist them in carrying out their legal responsibilities. And as previously mentioned, the DLAC may serve as the English Learner Parent Advisory Committee for the LCAP. However, in doing so, the DLAC would need to carry out the responsibilities of both committees. Next slide, please. So this slide goes over the responsibilities of the DLAC. And so responsibilities include advising the local governing board on the following items the development of a district master plan for English learners, conducting a district-wide needs assessment on a school-by-school -school basis, establishment of district program goals and objectives for English learner programs and services, development of a plan to ensure compliance with any applicable teacher and or teacher aid requirements, and also to review and comment on the district's reclassification procedures as well as required parent written notifications. Another important responsibility to note is that the DLAC must also have the opportunity to review the consolidated application. And again, just to note, if the DLAC serves as the English Learner Parent Advisory Committee for the LCAP, then in addition to these responsibility, responsibilities listed, the DLAC would need to provide input in the development of the LCAP. Next slide, please. So on March 17th, Governor Gavin Newsom signed Executive Order N2920, stating that subject to notice and accessibility requirements set forth in the order, a local legislative body or state body is authorized to hold public meetings via teleconferencing and to make public meetings accessible, accessible telephonically or otherwise electronically to all members of the public seeking to observe and to address the local legislative body or state body. And although this guidance is related to board meetings and the Brown Act, CDE has indicated that these flexibilities also apply to committees that adhere to the Green Act, such as parent advisory committees, DLACs, school site councils, and ELACs. On April 23rd, the governor signed Executive Order N5620, 
and extended the language about public meetings to ELACs and DLACs. So as a result of the executive orders, public meetings such as parent advisory committee, English learner parent advisory committee, school site councils, ELAC and DLAC meetings may be conducted telephonically or via any virtual platform accessible on participants' mobile devices, tablets, or computers, provided that the LEA follows the requirements specified in the executive order. And this includes providing parents with, with advance notice of the meeting time, agenda, and teleconferencing information. Next slide, please. So in terms of documenting meetings, you'll want to be sure to maintain documentation of any virtual advisory committee meetings that are held. And examples of evidence to maintain to verify the meeting and attendees include recorded audio or video file of the meeting, recording the participants' names from a verbal or visual roll call in the meeting minutes, also taking a screenshot or a printout of the participant list, or even a combination of these items. And if the committee is taking action on an agenda item, you'll also want to be sure to document this as well. And this can be done through the chat, through a poll, a visual or verbal vote that is also documented in the meeting minutes. So there's a variety of ways to document that. And so now I will turn it over to Bonnie for the consolidated application. Whoop. Rachel? Yes. Oh, did, did that come? I, I got a message. I got muted. <laughs> and did, uh, the question was, could you, um, and as I said, I think you may have addressed it after the question came in, but it's asking for clarification on the EL committees. And the question was, is there a difference between the, uh, the, um, the ELAC and the EL PAC? So uh, could you just clarify those committees and the differences? Yes, the ELAC is a school level committee, so it's the school level English Learner Advisory Committee. And the EL PAC, the English Learner Parent Advisory Committee, that's a district level committee um, pursuant to Education Code 52063 to provide input on the development of the LCAP. And so, as I mentioned, that committee is required if the district has at least. 15% enrollment of English learners and at least 50 English learners. Okay. All right, we had some other questions and we might want to um, follow up on some of these, but maybe you can um, uh, respond as best you can. They're all related to charter schools. And um, the first one had to do with um, the requirement for parent advisory and the applicability to charter schools. And then the other one had to do uh, with the difference between an e ELAC versus a DLAC when you're a charter. And do you have to have two committees and how does that work? Um, any, any thoughts on those two? So for charter schools, the English Learner Parent Advisory Committee, the ELPAC, so for input in the, the, L, the LCAP or the Learning Continuity and Attendance Plan, that is not required for charter schools. And so for um, going back to the LCAP, so not to be confused with the Learning Continuity and Attendance Plan, but the regular LCAP, there is um, in ed code, if the charter school uses the LCAP as its school plan, then in that case, the EL PAC would be required. But if a charter school does not use the LCAP as its SIPSA, then it is not a required committee. And so in this year, since there is not an LCAP, um, that statute is not applicable. And going back to the learning um, continuity and attendance plan, that's not a requirement for charter schools to have 
the PAC or the EL PAC? Hopefully I explained that correctly. Yeah, and I think there's one related question. I think it has to that confusion between the EL PAC and the DLAC and how those two are actually, while they can be a, one committee, while the, they do have different responsibilities, because the, the question is saying if parent advisory committee and the EL PAC aren't required for charters, does that mean we don't need the DLAC signature on the CON app? So can you? Can you kind of parse those two committees out a little bit again? Yeah, the, the DLAC is a separate committee. And so the DLAC is required if the, if the LEA has um, more than 50 EL. And so there's different requirements for the DLAC. For a charter school, it's a little bit different in terms of the DLAC and the ELAC. It's just one committee. Um, that charter schools would need, but we may have to get back on that one in terms of um, which requirements the charter school follows, whether it's the DLAC or the ELAC requirements. Okay. Unless one of my colleagues can step in on that. Thanks so much, Rachel. Appreciate you, Parson. It's, they're kind of confusing with those two committees, so appreciate you folks who asked the questions. Great questions. All right, so let's move on to the consolidated application. We included the CON app in this section um, because it's a companion document to the LCAP federal addendum, which uh, Rachel reviewed. The addendum provides the program descriptions for your federal programs for Title I, II, III, and IV, those key federal programs. And the CON app is the companion document because it provides the fiscal and data reporting for those same programs. So they really are two pieces of the same thing. Uh, unlike the addendum, however, which sub is submitted once for every ESEA reauthorization, and then it's just locally updated, the CONAP is submitted annually in a two-part submission. So let's take the next slide and take a little closer look, okay? The CONAP is important to you because it's the document that allows you to annually identify which funds of those four funding sources the district or uh, charter school wants to receive. And then it's also the, the document that allows for those funds to flow from the state to your LEA. So it's critical that way. It's what triggers your funding. The application is an online submission and it's through the CONAP reporting system, which is called CARS, which is the system if you've worked in CDE for FPM or anything else, it's, it's very similar and pretty intuitive, but this is annually required. Next slide. The consolidated application is, as I mentioned, it's a two-part submission. Normally, of course, this is not normal, but normally it's submitted in June of uh, the year, uh, June by June 30th, it has to be submitted. This year, the submission date was pushed forward to August 17th. So you have a, a later approval date, but normally it's June 30th. And that's the, the initial submission. And that's when you identify um, that you are interested in receiving the funds. You may identify um, programs that you're gonna include and you're going to also provide some year-end data. The winter submission is due the end of February and that one identifies your entitlements for each funded program. Although those are posted throughout the year, they're final in, um, uh, in the CON app. And then it also includes things like um, distri distribution of Title I to sites, uh, budget allocations, expenditure reports, in, and uh, some other pieces that are included in various submissions in the CONAP are legal assurances. And um, there's also instructions and guidance along with the CONAP that are very helpful in helping you submit it. So just an overview, but keep in mind, it's one application, but two submissions. The spring submission is the one that requires local board approval. The winter submission, does not require local board approval, it's optional. Some boards want to see it because they want to see the final funding amounts, but essentially the board has to approve you requesting to participate in the programs, okay? All right, next. This is um, a, 
an overview of the two releases. And you can find these on the CDE website, but you can see all the submissions that are required. And you'll notice the one is the winter submission on the left and the spring submission is on the right. And as you can see, each submission includes multiple years worth of data. So you're going back in uh, these, both of these submissions, you're going back to 2018, 19 information that you're having to report because those funds typically would be expiring. This year we got an extension on those, um, on those funds. Excuse me, it's 18, 19, we got an, uh, we got an in, um, extension on, but it's three years worth of data that you're reporting on. And on the right-hand side, the spring collection, you'll see there's, there's, um, there's a, the application for funding is at the bottom of the page where you have to certify a number of things, uh, agree to assurances. Okay, next. Okay, so I mentioned legal assurances. In the spring, when you submit your application for funding, your superintendent or designee has to sign off that they agree to abide by all the legal assurances. And those legal assurances are um, cover all the programs that are being uh, funded. So each section has something. And then there are some general assurances. Uh, just a reminder that those general assurances deal with things like civil rights requirements, services for English learners, and they aren't dependent on what funding source you take. If you take any federal funds, those are triggered. The reason we mention that is because these, these assurances are very closely tied to the compliance monitoring process. So when you get an FPM, many of those legal assurances that you agreed to are in the instruments used to review your program. And some of those are not program specific. So for example, there are English learner requirements that are basic civil rights requirements for English learners for access and such. And people think, well, uh, that's only if I get Title III and that's not the case. You still have to abide by those requirements. So we always recommend you read the assurances ahead to make sure there's nothing surprising in them. All right. All right. So, other reports in the in the consolidated application. I mentioned expenditure reports, and you'll see they come periodically. They ask for reports for some programs after six months, then again after 12, 18, 24 months. 24 months is usually when you're coming to the end of a program. So you're closing it up. Title III is the one they ask for most frequently. They ask you to report. How are you spending your money? And that's because Title III is one program where the funds sometimes don't get, don't get spent. So you have to report how much you expended by category, including administrative and indirect costs. There's also a carryover report for Title I because Title I has a limit on how much you can spend, uh, how much you can carry over into the next year. And included in the consolidated application is the waiver request. And this year that uh, carryover, the 15% um, carryover limitation was lifted. However, you'll still need to request that waiver and CDE now has the authority to approve it. Uh, LEA authorized reservations for Title I are reported in the application. School level allocations are included and there's significant amount of information related to your required services for participating private schools. This is for school districts only. And then there are various certifications that are required by federal law that you have nothing in your board policies that prohibits um, constitutionally protected prayer, uh, there are also options for using a consolidated administrative costs, and that's included in the application. And finally, your homeless policy and uh, indicating that you're meeting all the requirements for homeless youth is another part of the application. All right. So the Con app is only one application, and there's a lot in it, but not everything is in it. As I noted, it's only now Title I, II, III, and IV funds. So all your state funds, including LCFF, ACES, and all other state um, uh, uh, allocated funds, they're outside the CONAP. Also outside the CONAP are discretionary or competitive grants, so comprehensive support and improvement is not an allocated formula grant, so CSI. 
of funds, you had to do a separate application for it. Title IV Part B are your after school 21st century programs. That's a competitive grant, not in the Con App. Also other federal programs, uh, Perkins and IDEA are not in the Every Student Succeeds Act. They're separate federal programs. So those have separate applications. For this year, there's some additional funding sources that are outside the consolidated application and those come through the Federal CARES Act. Under the CARES Act, there were um, a couple of funding sources that were specific to K-12. And the first was the Elementary and Secondary Emergency Relief Funds, ESSER funds. You should already have submitted the application for those funds. It's a separate application through the CDE website. It was essentially agreeing to the required assurances for those funds. But those were Federal CARES Act. You're not going to see them in the CON app, so make sure you've applied for those funds. The others are the Governor's Emergency Education Relief Funds. Those went to the Governor's Office and they are now allocated through uh, something called the Learning Loss Mitigation Funds. Those also require a separate application and that's included with also something called the Coronavirus Relief Funds, which are outside of education programs. Those aren't education funds, but they were allocated to the state and the governor included them in the learning loss mitigation funds. So let's take a look at the learning loss mitigation funds quickly, okay? This is a funding source that pulled together three different um, fun funding, uh, uh, what, funding sources into one package. It includes two of the CARES Act funds we just talked about, the GEAR funds, the governor's uh, emergency relief funds, and the coronavirus relief funds. Both of those are included and also included in the learning loss mitigation funds are some state general funds. The GEAR funds were allocated to districts based on the number of um, students with disabilities and the total student population. The coronavirus uh, relief funds were based on a proportional share of your supplemental and concentration grant funds and the state funds that are allocated through the learning loss mitigation funds are based on a proportional share of your, oops, that's not enough Fs in there, LCFF entitlement. All right, so let's take a look at what you can do with those funds. They've targeted the funds to specific uh, services as, and they kind of fit with what the title is, learning loss mitigation, and that's what the use of funds is all about. There are actually four uses, and the first is addressing learning loss, closing achievement gaps, um, doing things that like beginning uh, school early and uh, continuing intensive instruction into the school year. Also extending the instructional year or increasing the amount of, of instructional time or services provided to pupils. The next slide shows the next two. And that's providing additional academic services for pupils. You'll see they're all kind of similar here, but this includes diagnostic assessments uh, for, for learning needs, intensive instruction for addressing uh, achievement gaps additional materials, supports, or devices for connectivity. And then finally, providing integrated pupil supports to address other barriers. So this takes us beyond the strict academic area and looks at health counseling, mental health, and professional development services. These funds are all, um, the application just came out recently, not too long ago, within the last few weeks. It's on the CDE website, put learning loss mitigation, and you'll find a link there. You should have a password that went to your superintendent. And uh, based on that, you go in and certify the assurances to make sure those funds are flowing to your district or charter school. All right. All right. So, looks like we have some questions. Uh, you know, uh, um, yeah, the, the last question about the timeline, those funds, I, it is, I think if you check on the learning loss mitigation website, because I just came across that today and it, I don't recall, I believe it was September, they're looking to get those funds out to schools, but um, I believe it's on there. If not, we'll follow up on that question and get you a for sure. 
No. Um, and let's see. Oh, gear funds were allocated to the population must be used with scholars with no the the way the funds i uh, we talk i'm glad that question came up it's a question about does the way the funds are allocated reflect how they're supposed to be spent no unlike lcff that defines certain populations based on those were the populations who generated the funds in this case they used a formula to identify who those students are but the funds don't have to be used specifically for those students so they are part of of those four allowable uses those students are going to be included there but you don't have to like target particular funds to particular student groups okay and as for the um the private school and cares act no that has not been addressed yet that's in litigation right now the question had to do there was initially um, federal law and the cares act said that funds for equitable services were to be um the funding for uh, private schools was to be determined based on uh 1117 which is the title one section of the law when guidance came out from the u.s department of education it said differently and said that it would be total enrollment that should be used um cde on their on their website you will find that they took a stance and disagreed with that determination since then, um, the Department of Education issued what they called rules, which are uh, going through the comment period for regulations, but apparently have the effect of regulations. Those regulations um, say they give an option, and they say that um, LEAs can, well, again, it's districts because private schools don't have to um, provide equitable services. So school districts may, um, they, it's, it's recommended that total enrollment be used that's their stance however they say uh, they, they say you may use either prior years numbers for um, low-income students your title one numbers or you may use new numbers for low-income students you would serve only the students within your only the schools within your district boundaries so unlike title one you don't have the outreach component serve only those schools in your district boundaries you may use low-income numbers if you do they put some restrictions on public schools and those uh, restrictions include only allowing use with um, in identified district title one schools and services only for low-income students and the requirement to abide by a supplement not supplant provisions so it's possible to go either way under the regulations and um, and use either enrollment or low-income numbers and uh but there are those restrictions according to federal law our attorney general has joined other states in a lawsuit opposing these regulations and they are also included in legislation that's now in congress congress is attempting to clarify that their intent was that you use low-income numbers that was probably a longer answer than you were hoping for um, and, and not as clear, but that's where things stand now. In the meantime, we're recommending that districts maintain consultation with private schools relative to services. If private schools are um, uh, agree to use low income numbers, um, the, the guidance actually indicated that you might set aside those funds in case this, uh, uh, depending on the outcome of the lawsuit, so if the lawsuit um, says no you only have to use low income numbers then that's great you've already started that if you if the lawsuit turns out the other way then you would go back and renegotiate that so that's kind of where things are it got very convoluted the equitable services and i know private schools are contacting and asking for support you do need to consult with them so you're not in violation of providing timely and meaningful consultation all right all right, so next slide has a list of our upcoming webinars. Um, these are the dates and um, for our and topics for our upcoming modules. They're um, on two on, at two o'clock on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So next time we're going to look at site level planning, and that'll be next Tuesday. So we hope you can join us then. Uh, in the meantime, we will get those questions back up to you in an FAQ. 
And uh, we will hope to see you next week, but keep those questions coming to us either to the SFP mailbox or to your individual coordinator. All right. We'll leave it open for just a few minutes for questions, and uh, then we'll take, uh, see you next week.